time to uh, start looking for your seats. We will have a short welcome presentation in about 15 minutes, so if you need to get coffee, run to the bathroom, please do that now. And now is the time to turn off your cell phones, Blackberries, and other noise-making devices. We will start in about 10 minutes, in about 10 minutes.
going to ask everyone to please find your seats as soon as possible. Again, if you're standing next to somebody and they're talking and they're not sitting, just walk away from them. Yes, <laughs> that happens a lot. So as I start this morning, is this side over here ready to go? Not very good. Is this middle row ready to go? Got better. How about this far side over here? All right. How was yesterday for you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that good. So how was yesterday for you? All right. Good morning, everyone. This is day two. And I tell people if it takes someone else to get your motor running in the morning, well, you got a lot of work to do. So you should come here fired up, ready to go, committed, more passionate, because today, day two, is going to be phenomenal. So let the person next to you know, I am so ready to go. Just look at me. I am so ready to go. I am so ready to go. I mean, it should just be oozing out of you right now. It should just be draining out of you right now. All right, okay. All right, that's enough. That's enough. So to get this day going, we're going to start it off like we did yesterday. We're going to have an opening video, and then when I come back up to you, we'll start our program. One of my favorite scenes in a movie was, comes out of the movie Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. How many of you have seen this? This is the one where young Luke Skywalker is, is being trained as a Jedi Knight by Yoda, right? In this particular scene, uh, Yoda has Luke trying to levitate his X-Wing fighter out of the swamp, trying to use the force to lift out of the swamp. And, and so Luke tries. He, he concentrates and he gets, gets his X-Wing fighter out of the swamp just a little bit, then it drops back down. He, he, he concentrates a little bit harder and he gets the X-Wing fighter completely out of the swamp and he's trying to move it over to dry land, but before it gets there, a noise distracts him and the X-Wing fighter falls back into the swamp. Luke, over, uh, Luke looks over at Yoda and Yoda shakes his head. And Luke says, I'm trying. And Yoda lifts his head and he says, no. There is no try. <laughs> there is do or do not. <laughs> there is no try. There is do or do not. And we can only do, we can only achieve that place that you imagine if we walk together as tall trees, if we talk with one voice, voices in union.
five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. 1963 is not an end but a beginning. I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream that is deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream today. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they not will judge by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with, with this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope with this faith. We will be able to work together, to pray together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that one day we will be free. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every nation, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Can we have them hold up for a second? Uh, I just want to take the time to thank A2M for these young girls and this young man have come down here to start our program. And we so appreciate that you remind us that the dream will not die here, it will only grow. So let's give them another hand for what they have done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. At this time, I would like to recognize our distinguished guest. With us this morning, the 26th Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Craig McKinley. Also, also with us, the Director of the Air National Guard, Lieutenant General 
Harry Bud Wyatt. And the Deputy Director of the Army National Guard, Major General Tim Cadavy. Someone once said, it is better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. This next individual that I will bring to the stage was prepared for his assignments. This is our chief. This is our leader. This is the one who was committed, dedicated, passionate, has set the stage. My grandmother once told me, it's one thing to make history, but it's another thing to make sense. You can be the first of anything, but if you don't do something to make it better for everybody else, why are you there? Well, I can tell you without a doubt, our chief has made a difference. He has set the path. He's raised the bar. His standards are high. But I can tell you, I'm so proud that this is the individual that represents us every day in the 54 states, territories, and District of Columbia, because we got the best leader that life could offer. And I'll put him up against anybody in this entire world. Welcome at this time, General McKinley. Thank you very much. A great intro, thanks. Thank you all. Sit down, please. Good morning. I, uh, I'm only going to briefly take a few minutes of your time this morning to welcome everybody to Bill Burke's land. Uh, Bill, thanks for the opportunity to come to Nevada. Anytime you can escape the gravitational pull of the five-sided, I can't say the rest of the word, it's wonderful. It's a, it's, a, it's a pull that won't let you out of the beltway. And anytime you're outside the beltway in Washington, D.C., you're with real people, real human beings, great leaders, people who motivate and lead our great National Guard men and women. Uh, Ondra, thanks for uh, your great leadership. It's been a pleasure uh, having you work uh, right outside my office in, in the Pentagon, uh, working with General Wyatt, General Ingram, General Cadaby. Um, as you all know, he brings life and spirit and energy to everything he does. And even for us, uh, we need that. We need that passion because there are times, as, as Father Alphonse would tell you, where uh, you've had some rough times. And we've had some rough months here lately. For those of us who wear this color uniform, you know what I'm talking about. Um, for no apparent reason, our service decided to um, try to restructure us without really the opportunity for us to, to put our equities on the table. And General Wyatt and his team have been absolutely magnificent in trying to represent our interests. And General Cadavy, along with General Ingram, um, our new director of the Army National Guard, who would be here except he's fighting hard today uh, for full time and strength in the Army National Guard, and General Cadavy will tell you about that. Um, we're, gonna, we're going through those times in Washington, D.C., and they followed so shortly on the heels of the magnificent work all of you have done uh, in support of our national efforts uh, to rout out the evil doers who would want to take our freedoms and democracy away from us as they did on September 11, 2001. So I'm really happy to be here today. I'm happy that the adjutants general are here. Um, you all have some of the toughest schedules in the business. Uh, you've got so many commitments. You work for our commanders and chiefs, our governors, and I just can't thank you enough. And I know we have uh, representatives of almost all of our states, territories, and the district here today on behalf of the Adjutant General. We'll be meeting in Lincoln, Nebraska in about 10, 15 days, right, Judd? Uh, and we will have a very important session with your bosses uh, to kind of lay the landscape, kind of set, set the barometer of where we're going to be uh, going over the next three to five years with the leadership in your, in your organization. Uh, but I couldn't be more happy to be here. Uh, my journey started as chief. Uh, in Atlanta, and that's when Mr. Winters and his team in the Army National Guard, Tim, had, had kept the flame burning because we had kind of lost uh, some of our momentum uh, in the Air National Guard for no apparent reason, no fault of any human being, um, but we, we were a nation at war. We'd been at war for 11 straight years, but I'd like to thank Mr. Winters and the Army National Guard team who kept the flame alive. and. In Atlanta, we rededicated ourselves to putting a, an event like this together every year that I would be chief, and Bud Wyatt signed up to it, and at the time, uh, Ray Carpenter signed up to it, Tim Cadaby signed up to it, so we can bring the leadership, the senior leadership of our organizations here to talk about 
what's most important to us, and that's our people. And how those people will integrate and go forward and follow in our footsteps and lead and, and prosper and take us to places that we can only imagine today. So I'm going to speak a little more during my keynote address uh, a little bit later, but my intent today is to bring up uh, my wingman, uh, General Bud Wyatt, uh, who has an opportunity today to say a few things, show, show a little bit about what the Air National Guard's doing, and he will introduce General Cadby, who will in turn do that for the Army National Guard. Let me tell you a little bit about Bud Wyatt. Bud Wyatt and I started uh, in this business a long time ago, um, and we're damn lucky to be here today. Because in our era, um, the things that we grew up wanting to do, a lot of our friends uh, didn't quite make it through it. When you get in an F-100 that's got an afterburning engine and that afterburner blows up about once every 30 times, we have a lot of our friends who, who aren't in the business today. But that's what we love to do. And for those of you in the aviation business or whatever field you love doing, uh, that's what we signed up to do. General Wyatt went on to fly uh, on active duty, the F-106, one of the hardest airplanes to fly, and he did it as a lieutenant, unheard of at the time. So his aviation skills and credentials are, are there for everybody to see. But what I love about Bud Wyatt and Nancy, his spouse, is his commitment to the people who work with him. Uh, Rich, I know you know that firsthand. Uh, and those around us in the Pentagon uh, who see an adjutant general from the state of Oklahoma leave that, that job which he had mastered. He and Nancy were the first family of Oklahoma doing a great job and giving up that and coming to Washington, D.C. and joining uh, the meat grinder that we have uh, in Washington to do things for our airmen while we're at war. And Bud Wyatt and Nancy have been absolutely magnificent in doing that. And so I'd like to introduce uh, a great friend. We go back a long, long way, uh, a great leader, and a person who cares deeply about our National Guard, both Army National Guard and Air National Guard. And he will go to the mat for what we need to make sure that our young men and women are well taken care of. So I'll talk to you a little later this morning, and I welcome to the stage Lieutenant General Bud Wyatt. I am an American Airman. I am a warrior. I have answered my nation's call. I am an American Airman. My mission is to fly, fight, and win. I am faithful to a proud heritage. A tradition of honor and a legacy of valor. I am an American Airman. Guardian of freedom and justice. My nation's sword and shield and sentry and avenger. I defend my country with my life. I am an American airman, wingman, leader, warrior. I will never leave an airman behind. I will never falter. And I will not fail. Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? I am Bud from Oklahoma, but it's great to be here in Nevada today. I'll be in Oklahoma later on this afternoon, though. <laughs> uh, Nancy uh, sends her apologies for not being here uh, we're for, uh, for uh, not enough time uh, in Oklahoma. She's back getting the house ready for Memorial Day. Uh, I have a speech on Monday uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, we're going to have our kids and, and family in for uh, Memorial Day, first time we've gotten all of them together at one time in a long, long time. So uh, she sends her apologies for not being here. Chief, thanks for the kind remarks. Uh, you know, the only reason I uh, left the, the comfort of Oklahoma uh, to come to the, the Pentagon in Washington was because of the leadership of this man right here. When he became the chief of the National Guard Bureau, uh, I decided I would try to do what I could do to, to help the chief with his vision. And 
you know, part of his vision, and I think probably one of the things that he will be remembered for best uh, is his reignition uh, of the diversity flame. Uh, that's why we're all here. And I'd like to take just a little bit of time to tell you uh, how the Air Guard has uh, rekindled that flame where we are right now, give you a little bit of uh, my perspective on you know, where I think uh, we are at this point in time, what we've done the last few years, uh, where we are now, and maybe some of the things that this group can, can do to continue the endeavor and get us to the point where one of these days, it, it diversity will be such a part of our culture that we won't need a JDEC. We won't need diversity councils because it will just be a way of life. That it will be part of our DNA so that we will be the strong force that only diversity can get us to. So go back in time a little bit to Dr. Batanzas, okay? Uh, to me, Dr. Batanzas' mission in life was just to make us aware. Uh, because, uh, you know, after the, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, speech, uh, I think the country had kind of uh, failed on its promise, uh, had written a check that was yet to be cashed. Uh, that check doesn't have a statute of limitations, so maybe we need to move toward cashing that check. But uh, Dr. Batanza has made us aware, and then we, we got to that point where we started formulating strategic plans, and, and uh, Bill Burks, thank you for what you have done as the, uh, the chair of the JDEC to solidify that strategic plan and, and give us a vision uh, for the future. I'm so pleased to see that the states, a lot of the states, the majority of the states, have created state diversity councils so that we're getting that uh, buy-in at the state level, but also, more importantly, the participation at the state level. Uh, all of us play a part uh, in making this dream come true. Uh, we've got to push initiatives from the ground up, but we also need the type of leadership that General McKinley has given us, the type of leadership that the TAGs offer at the state level, the type of leadership that our, our command chief, master sergeants, our senior enlisted, our wing commanders uh, give us at the wing level. Everybody has got to do their part for us to get to that point where we want to be in the future. If you've uh, recently attended one of our um, commander courses, our National Guard commander courses that we offer to new commanders, if you've attended uh, any of the uh, uh, chiefs executive courses that we offer to all new uh, command chief master sergeants, um, you will see or you will have seen over the past couple of years that one of the things that I try to stress when I'm meeting with our new chiefs and our new commanders is the pillar that diversity plays in the Air National Guard. And I do it kind of this way. I put up a map of the United States of America, and on that map are 89 stars, representing the 89 wings of the Air National Guard. And when you look at that map, you kind of think, wow, you know, we, we start off with a pretty good opportunity for diversity. Uh, we've gotten to that point where the awareness, I think, is out there. The chief of staff of the United States Air Force has said that diversity is essential to mission accomplishment. And he is correct. He recognizes that. But I'm going to use an example of the United States Air Force that uh, I'm not exactly proud of. I don't think the chief is either. And we're working to change that. But I put this map up and I point out that we start out with a pretty good opportunity for diversity because we, were every, we are everywhere across the United States. But in each one of those stars, there is a different demographic, there is a different uh, people makeup, and we are in the people business, the most important business uh, in the Department of Defense. Uh, those stars uh, represent the 54 uh, Air Forces uh, inside the Air National Guard. And I point out to the chiefs that when I go to uh, the Corona meets, and we're gonna do another one in, in June, and for those of you who don't know what Corona is, it is a gathering of the Air Force four stars, and there are four three stars that are allowed to attend. Lieutenant General Eric uh, File, who is the uh, commander of Air Force Special Operations Command, Jim Kowalski, the uh, commander of uh, uh, Air Force Global Strike Command, General Stinner, Air Force Reserve Command, and I get to go. I'm not a commander, but uh, treated uh, as a MAGCOM uh, director, I guess you would say, and so we get to sit in. And uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I was sitting around the corona table, 
and uh, thinking about diversity. And I looked at the table, and we had all the four stars and the, uh, the three stars in there, and we have had the uh, the civilian, the secretary, and the undersecretary, and some of the secretariats in the room too. Around that table, there was one female, Undersecretary Conifer. There was one African American, Ed Rice, General Ed Rice, the commander of Air Education and Training Command. There were no Asian Americans. There were no Hispanics. Seventy percent of the people sitting around that room graduated from the same university. Air Force Academy, one of the greatest institutions of learning, higher learning, in the United States of America. Nothing wrong with the Air Force Academy. And I thought to myself, what sort of diversity do we have in this room with that gender and racial makeup and with that educational background? And as normally happens when we face the challenges of the Air Force in that room, we reach a, a conclusion and a consensus pretty quickly because there is a common thought process that goes on. There's not much diversity in the components. Everybody's active duty, except for one reservist and one guardsman. So the point I try to make to our command chiefs and our leaders is that think about the lack of diversity in that room and think about, ask yourself the question, did we get where we are with the Air Force's 13 budget because of that fact. And I think we probably did. And it's not meeting with a lot of acceptance on the Hill because the Hill is composed of people who are elected by the demographics inside your, your particular states. I think we could have done better and I think we can do better and I think we will do better but we've got to improve the communication process and we've got to, inside the United States Air Force, attack this diversity issue with the same fervor and dedication that we attack those things, as General McKinley had uh, mentioned, that uh, began happening to us on 9-11. On Think about the opportunities and the thought processes that would be available to you if sitting around that corona table you had men and women, you had African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, I'm from Oklahoma, Native Americans, Hawaiian Islanders, you had um, heterosexuals, homosexuals, bisexuals, you had Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, if you had rich people, poor people, middle income people, if you had not only Air Force Academy graduates, but you had SMU Mustangs, right Chief? <laughs> you get my point. Because if you bring that diversity of background inside that thought process, don't you think you would have many more courses of action, many more ideas much better ideas, and yes, it might be a little more difficult to come to a consensus, but it would sure beat the heck out of having a lot of people sit around the table nodding their heads, yes, this is what we need to do. That's the strength of diversity. That's the awareness part that I think we've done a pretty good job of getting to this point. So here we are in Nevada, and my concept, my, my uh, I guess, uh, thoughts on where we are now and where we need to go are like this. And you may agree with me or not, uh, just a, per, uh, a perspective that I throw out there. I think that we are at that point where we have the strategy, we have the awareness, we have the buy-in. Yeah, there are still some folks out there who have not bought into diversity and who never will. I think it's time to just recognize it. We, we probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time on those people. I think Darwin in his theory of evolution, survival of the fittest, probably would say that those folks will self-eliminate themselves from the gene pool of leadership. So, you know, they can either embrace diversity and move out with it, or they will, by their own design, be irrelevant in the future. 
they will become irrelevant in the future. So let's not spend a whole lot of time on those. Let's figure out where we want to go. It's time, I think, to and what we've been talking about in the Air National Guard and moving forward is operationalize diversity. Think of diversity as a weapon system. KC-135 is a fabulous weapon system that is a force multiplier. A force multiplier of all that combat capability. Without the KC-135, we would be much more limited in what we can do as an Air National Guard. Think of diversity as a for force multiplier, okay? It's not a stuff thing. We get carried away with airplanes and capabilities and we argue about force structure and stuff like that, but I guarantee you, regardless of the force structure that we come out of this budget in the Air National Guard, we're still gonna win as an Air National Guard because we have people. People who believe in diversity as a force multiplier that will allow us to get the mission done no matter what. And the more diverse we are, the quicker we will meet those challenges and the better the solutions will be. That's the power of diversity. We need to think about it as a weapon system and operationalize it. Give our adjutants general, our wing commanders, our command chiefs, our flight commanders, the folks that are in charge, the tools that will help them accomplish the diversity goals. You know, we can't just put people in places and think that that's gonna solve diversity. We have got to instill in our organization the processes and if you will, the DNA that will sustain itself from this point forward forever and ever. A huge challenge and we won't get it right the first time. That's why we need to continually focus on this, continually measure our progress, continually hold people accountable for the goals that we wanna reach as an organization. So now comes the hard part. We have the awareness, we have the strategy, we're gonna kick off operations, they're gonna give us the tools that we need to get the job done, and then we're gonna implement that. And I don't care what tools we have, uh, how many resources we put toward this initiative, the key to it has gotta be that the people that make this initiative work are the ones that are gonna make it a success. Don Shepard told me a long time ago, he said, uh, I was talking to him about uh, the problems that the Air National Guard was having a couple years ago with, uh, with the core values and with ethics. Uh, we had had a lot of, uh, unfortunately, uh, a few folks with uh, um, a little bit different view of the Air National Guard core values. And it was bringing visibility in the wrong way to the Air National Guard. And I asked General Shepard, I said, uh, you know, you had a similar problem with flight safety. People were dropping F-16s in backyards uh, at a, an enormous rate. And uh, he said, yeah, we did. And we started the safety summit. Uh, but he said it, it was, he said, I, I recognized early on that I, as an individual, were not, was not going to be able to fix this problem, that it had to be fixed by the people in the field because they had to take ownership of the issue. But it was because of his vision and his focus on that that we started the safety summit. And we continue that today. And look what we did with that. We have gone from the worst flying safety organization in the Department of Defense to the best flying safety organization in the Department of Defense. But we haven't lost our focus. We continue to reevaluate ourselves and to measure ourselves for success. It is now, safety is now part of our DNA. I see the day when diversity goes through that same process and becomes part of our DNA, where we will lead not only the Department of Defense, but we will lead the country in diversity. We will be the model. We will be the organization. National Guard, Army and Air National Guard will be the organization that all of DOD and the civilian community will look to as the example of how diversity is supposed to work. When you stop and think about it, it is a core value issue for the Air National Guard. It is the right thing to do. So let's give the people the tools and the operations and the focus that they need to get the job done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please be seated. We, uh,
We had the opportunity to meet with uh, Bill Ingram yesterday, and you know, as the schedule indicated, he was uh, planning on being here. Uh, Chief mentioned it. Uh, General Cadavy is going to talk about it uh, just a little bit. Uh, General Ingram wanted uh, sincerely to be here today, but there are some big things happening uh, at the four-star level in the United States Army right now that requires his presence in D.C. Uh, but I tell you what, the, uh, the guy that I'm going to introduce next, uh, Major General Tim Cadavy, former Adjutant General for the great state of Nebraska, had the opportunity to work with Tim in the, in the Pentagon, I had the opportunity to work with him when he was an Adjutant General. Uh, I know he is passionate about this topic. Uh, he's been here, I think he came in the day before yesterday, as a matter of fact, spent a lot of time with you. Uh, we had a great discussion at dinner last night. I know where his heart is, and you'll see it in his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Major General Tim Cadavy, Deputy Director, Army National Guard. soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined, physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert. And I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, engage and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an American soldier. Good morning. I tell you, this is a great looking crowd of uh, Army and Air National Guardmen, and it's a great looking crowd because it is probably as diverse a crowd as I've seen in some time. I've been on the, uh, the JDIC, and I've been at both of the, uh, the national conferences associated with diversity and have attended various meetings. And I tell you, this crowd represents our nation and represents our Guard. So thanks, everybody, for being here. General Wyatt, thanks for the, uh, the kind comments. Uh, we've known each other for, for quite some time, uh, adjutant generals together, and have served in the Pentagon with him the last uh, almost three years and, and tremendous leader. General McKinley, thanks for your, your leadership. Uh, without it, we would not be at this point that we are as a guard. You've led us through some tremendous challenging times, changing times, and you set us on a foundation that will take us well into 2020 and beyond as the Army looks at its, its long-term uh, plans. So without that, we would not be there, sir. So, so thank you. Uh, General Burks, thanks so much for the work you do. I, I mentioned I've been on the JDIG since the very beginning. I remember the first meeting in September about two and a half years ago. I've been to both of the executive committees associated with the conference. And I tell you, this is what I believe. I believe because of uh, the leadership of General Burks and his rest of his team. Would the executive committee put your hands up so everybody can kind of take a look at those that are sitting on it and, and if you get a chance, uh, tell them thank you because I tell you they're doing a tremendous job as it's related to moving diversity forward. What I believe is that we are at the verge of an explosion of energy as it relates to diversity within uh, the National Guard. Uh, a lot of discussion about what diversity has been over the last two and a half years and, and the discussions in the JDIG have evolved thanks to the, again, the leadership of General Burks. And it's kind of culminated at this point right here with the training going on, uh, with the speakers that you've seen. Uh, I, I just think we're ready to take the next step. And we are a world-class organization, and this is what world-class organizations do. So General Burks, thank you. Thank you to the JDIC. And, and also, thank you for, for hosting us here in, 
in Reno, Nevada. I tell you, we've, we've wanted for nothing, uh, tremendous uh, service, tremendous support. Uh, so if you would, please tell the rest of your Nat Nevada team on behalf of the Army Guard Directorate, uh, thank you. Lieutenant General Ingram very much wanted to be here today. I mean, he truly wanted to be here, and there was very few things that probably would have kept him from here, but in the, uh, the March-April time frame of, of the United States Army, that's when we build our program, which is where we're going to put the dollars over the next five years. And I will tell you, having built, this is my third program that I've helped the Army Guard build in conjunction with the Army. This is probably the most difficult because of all the budget cuts and the changing of the Army as it comes out of Iraq, it'll come out of Afghanistan, the dollars have been reduced. Just so you know, you know, three, four years ago, $250 billion, give or take, with the base in OCO that the Army had to, to execute its program. Now we're building a, a program that's going to be about 140 billion. So if you had to lose 100 billion, you'd have to make a lot of hard choices. So there's a lot of hard choices, and everything's on the table, and there are a tremendous amount of Army Guard equities uh, that are going to be discussed today at what they call the Senior Review Group, uh, the Big Four get together. Secretary of the Army, Chief of Staff of the Army, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, and the uh, Under Secretary of the Army. And it was where General Ingram needed to be today. And he feels, I know he feels very bad that he wasn't able to make it out here. It's been on his calendar for some time and he wanted me to uh, deliver his, his message. So I'm gonna break from kind of the trend here so far. I'm gonna get behind the podium. I've been a soldier a little over 30 years now. And, and what I'll tell you, if you wanna last that long as a soldier, you learn that you follow your boss's guidance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump behind the podium and I'm gonna deliver his message that he wanted to give you here today. This is our first opportunity to talk about the theme of this conference, in pursuit of greatness through diversity. In my opinion, those words were very carefully chosen. Our theme is not only inspiring, it is intended to set the tone for our members. It also reflects the nation that we serve because diversity is not just a desired outcome of an afternoon workshop. This conference is a celebration of the differences in ethnicity, gender, age, beliefs, tribes, dialects, regions, accents, territory, and even profession. These differences make us unique. It is our differences that make us stronger. For men and women who wear the uniform, for the soldiers and airmen, of the National Guard, diversity perfectly aligns with our core values. And I think that's what the videos have been trying to get across to us over the last two days. Diversity is essential for reasons that go far beyond how our formations look. For this fighting force, diversity is vital to the mission's success. What an advantage we have in achieving operational and combat readiness. In the words of the publisher, Malcolm Forbes, Diversity is the art of thinking independently together. It is also how we achieve our goals together. As you may know, we still have work to do. We have lots of work to do. Recently, there have been events where soldiers have behaved unprofessionally. As a consequence, they have gained the attention of news organizations for all the wrong reasons. These occurrences must be acknowledged. They must be addressed. And they must be seen by every soldier as not representative of the guard we have today or the culture or the values of which we live and do our jobs. The very fact that we are here underscores diversity as a worthy topic that deserves our attention and our efforts. So it falls to us to expand awareness. We're responsible for creating opportunities for growth and development inside our diverse organization. This inclusion will stand as proof of the respect we have for one another. Encouraging diversity within our ranks is not something we just dreamed up a few years ago. The National Guard has been and always will be a fundamental part of our communities where we live, work, and play. And we reflect the, the faces of those communities in our ranks. Many of you know that over the last year we celebrated our 375th 
birthday as an organization, and we're well into our 376 years as a military organization serving both our states and nation. From our earliest days as a militia, right up to this day, Guard members answer the call to serve community, state, and country whenever and wherever we are needed. My personal perspective on diversity takes demographics into account. The charts, the graphs, the metrics of diversity are a vital part of understanding and measuring where our organization is today. But statistics only tell part of the story. We have to look past the recruiting percentages levels based solely on ethnic background because true diversity helps us retain the skilled and talented people we recruit. At the same time, the spirit of inclusion puts a spotlight on the importance of each and every individual. That's the path to the 21st Century National Guard, and that's how we forge citizens into trained, equipped, and ready warriors. Our combatant commanders, our governors, and our presidents will count on now and into the future. We realize we are mentoring the next generation of leaders and preparing them to take over the reins of our organization. What do we want to leave them, and how do we want them to lead? Those are some of the questions we have to think about today. We know that we must be prepared to lead a diverse force, not only because a diverse force is better for the Guard, but because there is no other option. Just a week ago, and we talked about this last night, the Washington Post had a front page story announcing to the nation that for the first time in our nation's history, the majority of the babies born in America this year are not white. And in about 20 years, those babies that are being born in 2012 will be our newest crops of privates and lieutenants. They are our future, and the future of our America's Guard is inevitably going to be more diverse. It's up to us to train and mentor the next generation of leaders so that they are ready for the task. That means leading by example and embracing diversity. It requires us to view our differences as our greatest advantage. Some of us are already there, bring passion and a sense and inclusion to everything we do. The great success stories of our diversity, the award winners, prove this point. They have been singled out for, for doing all the right things and for setting the examples that we must point to with pride. They are the models of our guard and of our guard diversity. Diversity de defines America, and the National Guard is America. Again, on behalf of General Ingram, we appreciate the opportunity to join you here today. I'm certain that each of you will successfully apply the important lessons and training that you've received at this conference to help shape our Guard for the future. Thank you. Thank you, General McKinley, General Wyatt, who uh, I can tell you over the, I've watched just grow and sprout with uh, diversity, which I so appreciate. And then from having General Cadavy be a part of the JDAC and listening to his heart about this topic. And it's so good to know that our leaders are not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. And so many organizations cannot say that. So at this time, I would like to invite to the stage Ms. Phyllis Brantley, to talk about the National Guard Special Emphasis Programs. Ms. Phyllis, Phyllis Brantley is the NGB Division Chief for Diversity and Special Emphasis Programs. And when I also talk about Ms. Brantley, she is, I guess you could say my wingman, battle buddy, but most of all warrior, because she fights every day relentlessly to ensure that we have the best initiative in this country. So I call to the stage just Ms. right now, Ms. Brantley. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's give yourself a hand also. You're wonderful. You've been doing an excellent job. And we could not get this job done without you. And I want you to know that. And before we leave here today, I hope that you take with you all of the tools, the great initiatives that have, have been established for you, and take the motivation from this group 
because I'm telling you, Colonel Barry's not the only one that's motivated. I'm fired up and ready to go. That's why I have my red on today. <laughs> Sir, I just want you to know, the opening line that Colonel Barry gave you, I wrote it. <laughs> I've been around the National Guard for a long time. Mr. Winters, I think we kind of share that. And I will tell you that this is the very first time that I've had the pleasure of having senior leaders that really, truly care. Sir, I don't know what we're going to do without you. So we have a short amount of time to get this right. Are you on board? Yes. No. Are you on board? Yes. Are you fired up? Yes. Don't make me get upset up here. <laughs> I also have a very short time to talk. But that's OK. The special emphasis programs, and I have to click. I'm doing good, right? The special emphasis programs is a program that has been around and is a mandated program by law. And when I first took over this program, I don't understand why it was so hard to get everyone to embrace. Maybe it's because it was a compliance. But I want to make known to you that this is a tool that although it is mandated by law, it is a proactive equal employment opportunity tool that would help get us to what we want to be, and that is a diverse workforce. So although I have a short amount of time just to speak very briefly to special emphasis programs, I want to kind of whet your appetite so that you will seek out your uh, state equal employment managers, the special emphasis program managers that you already have in your states, or just call me or Ms. Ray Morris or Chief Lanier or Rodney Haig. Find us. We can tell you more about special emphasis programs. I will also call to your attention for the very first time, our chief of the National Guard Bureau signed a letter about special emphasis programs and affinity group information. Never in the history of the National Guard has that ever been done before. Thank you, Chief. It's in this book. You've seen this book on our table, on our JDEC table. I need for you to pick up extra copies and take it back to your commands and battalions and hand it out. We need to get the word out. Ms. Ray Morris has already, always, um, also for the very first time, created for you information on minority outreach. You need to read this. You need to take this information back. The National Guard is on board, and we're doing great things, and it's great meat for you to take back to your diversity councils. We all have heard of the Hispanic employment and all of these programs that you hear here, but I don't, I don't really know if you know, understand that this is a management tool now, a lot of individuals will use, or agencies will use, a special emphasis program manager uh, for observances. That's OK. They're allowed to advise and bring that cultural awareness. But what I want to impress upon you today is that they do a lot more than that. I'm going to name a couple of things that they can do to assist you. They can assist in identifying barriers to the hiring, development, and advancement of these various groups that were on stage. Y'all help me here. You're not supposed to be looking at me. <laughs> they can identify ways to ensure equal consideration for promotions, training, and awards. They can keep managers and key personnel aware of program goals and objectives. They can pro provide, uh, perform as liaisons between recruiters and organizations, which can assist in recruitment efforts and activities. They can develop and maintain positive working in, uh, relationships with community professionals and national organizations, colleges, and universities. They can also, that tool, the management directive, uh, uh, 715, uh, the uh, annual narrative statistical report, 
the uh, Air National Guard annual report, they can also assist you with the workforce analysis with that, those reports. Your special emphasis programs should be linked to ongoing mission priorities. They should be identified in your strategic plans. Let me give you an example of if you have an active special emphasis program, what would, what would be happening? You would have progress toward achieving a diverse workforce uh, at all grade levels and in all occupations. You would have a decrease in employment complaints and findings of discriminations. You would have an increase in early complaint resolution rates, an increase in awareness and training efforts, and a recruitment efforts of underutilized and underserved communities. I cannot express enough that if you use this proactive equal opportunity tool as a manager, you will achieve a diverse workforce. That's just a little bit, a tiny bit of what special emphasis program managers can do for you. I'm down to three minutes. I want to bring to the stage because I really believe that this is really a big portion of what we should be doing here today. Uh, we have had the opportunity to have as an invited guest um, one of my dear, dear uh, friends of working for years, uh, plenty of years as an infinity group, uh, Chairman Danny uh, Carso. He is the Chair, Society of American Indian Government Employees. He is going to give you an overview of the organization and the best practice case for affinity groups within organizations. He's also going to share the background and mission of his umbrella organization, the National Correlation for Equity in Public Service, the INSEPS. Chairman Carson. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brantley. I also want to thank uh, General McKinley for your leadership in diversity and inclusion. Uh, Ms. Brantley, Ms. Uh, Ray Morris, uh, for their untiring efforts uh, to make this day happen and everything that they've been doing over the years uh, to make diversity and inclusion part of the National Guard. Uh, so please give them a hand uh, for what they've done. Uh, I, I know there's some people who know me in here, have heard me speak before, uh, some for many years, that are shaking their heads right now. They say it's a dangerous thing to give Danny Garso a stage and a microphone. Uh, I can sometimes get a little long-winded, but I promise you I'll keep this short uh, because we got important business here today. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about NCEPS, National Coalition for Equity and Public Service. As the chairman of SAGE, as the presidents of the other uh, affinity groups, we sit in a coalition on a board of directors and we share best practices and, and ideas and help each other out in those training and, and leadership challenges that we have in federal government. And when I say federal government, I also include uniform uh, employees too of all branches of service uh, because you too are federal employees and uh, so we welcome you to join our affinity groups. Uh, NCEPS has been around for quite a while, and uh, it includes uh, big blacks in government, federally employed women, few, uh, FAPAC, Federal Asian Pacific American Council, uh, National Image Inc., uh, which represents the Hispanic community, and then SAGE. And we are in the process of working with the National Disabilities Group to bring them into NCEPS also and make them part of the council. Uh, SAGE itself is really the, the young kid on the block. Uh, we didn't become a member of uh, INCEPS until 2005, but that seems to be kind of a, a telling story with American Indian Alaskan Natives in our society. Uh, we are the last to, to, uh, population group uh, to get to vote. Um, we're normally the last ones to be included in a program, and, and these are things that I didn't realize until I actually became the chair of SAGE and started to take a look at published government reports 
that didn't even list American Indian, Alaska Natives many times in those reports as a minority. We truly are a minority within a minority and get overlooked quite often. But we're a significant population group. There are 565 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Indian country stretches from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the northernmost boundaries to the southernmost boundaries. There's American Indian tribes and American Indians amongst all of you, you just may not recognize them because of diversity in Indian country. Uh, so I'm asking you to look around and make sure that you are including American Indians and Alaskan Natives uh, when it comes to your planning, when it comes to your program, because they are a piece of that melting pot that I truly believe brings a, a, great, a great amount of significance uh, to making you a stronger organization. I wanted to briefly tell you how I got up here on this stage, how I became um, uh, the chairman of SAGE. Uh, it was actually not too long ago, about, well, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet ago, uh, that I had short hair and was a sergeant major in the National Guard, working on the Michigan Diversity State uh, Council. And while I was working there, uh, we were sending people to blacks in government conferences, we were sending people to, to few conferences and to national image conferences, and we were submitting people, our soldiers and airmen, to for these national awards and send them to these conferences. And me being the, the recruiting advisor and also the, the American Indian CEPM, I said, what do I have? Again, we weren't included. And then uh, Master Sergeant uh, Flores sent me an email that said, Society of American Indian Government Employees, first annual training program, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I said, I gotta go check that out. And I went and checked it out and it was one of the most impressive training conferences I went to. Uh, so with that, I became more involved with them. I brought back what I learned to the state of Michigan. And then when I retired, I started serving on their board and that's how I became the chair and standing here right now. But I wanna ask you three things as I finish up. I wanna ask you to become members of SAGE. Anybody can become a member. You don't have to be an American Indian, Alaska Native. Uh, but I ask you to become a member uh, because you're part of leadership, because you're part of diversity. Uh, membership is very cheap. You probably wouldn't even notice it uh, out of your pocket. But I want you to become a member and start checking out who SAGE is and start participating. I also want you to ask your fellow airmen, your fellow soldiers to become members, especially those that are American Indian, Alaska Native, but also those that are serving in leadership positions, serving in diversity positions, and uh, also serving on councils and in recruiting. Uh, that's something that I, that I also recommend for you is to, to bring recruiters maybe to this diversity conference. Because if there is somebody that can help increase your diversity, it is that recruiting command. Uh, and then one last thing I just wanted to say, because I've, I've only had a few minutes here, is there is a lot of information in these two booklets that Ms. Uh, Brantley said. Please pick up a copy. They tell you a little bit about FEW, about BIG, about INCEPS, about IMAGE, about SAGE. Uh, so please take a look at these booklets. Uh, also this one right here actually lists all the, the places that your recruiting command can go look for that diversity with minority colleges that are, that are stretched again from the East Coast to the West Coast, from North and South. So with that, I'd just like to say, McGwitch, thank you very much from SAGE, and uh, thank you for having me here. You must forgive me. I've been hanging around Colonel Berry too long. Um, what I neglected to say is that um, I sit on the planning committee at the DOD level, and every year uh, the DOD uh, sends out uh, an annual listing of all of the affinity groups that we participate in. And I would venture to say there's about anywhere from 50 to 60 of those groups. Because of the amount of time that it takes and the, the, the travel and the, the financing of that, um, we only uh, really participate with really the instant, maybe a few more, probably about 10 out of the 60. So I really encourage you to really get involved. Uh, we actually started uh, with the permission of uh, our JDEC chair, a subcommittee on the JDEC to really focus more on this. So I really appreciate it, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have often heard of groups forming collaborative
collaborative agreements such as memorandum of understandings. But what is it? It is an agreement between parties. It expresses a convergence of will between the parties, indicating an intended line of action. In this case, National Guard and SAGE. In 2011, the National Guard, in concert with the Society of American Indian Employee, Government Employees, SAGE, developed a memorandum of understanding which provides a partnership between these two organizations. SAGE is the only na uh, national American Indian Alaska Native affinity group which represents all government employees, civilians, and uniform. As an affinity group, they are neither a union nor politically biased. SAGE also provides the widest network between government and American Indian Alaska Native organizations, educational institutions, and Indian nations. My boss is already on the stage, but sirs, will you please join us? Thank you. The Memorandum of Understanding was a catalyst for the Chiefs National Guard Bureau Joint Diversity Co Executive Council, the JDEC, to hold its summer session at the 2011 SAGE training program in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma. This was the first time that the Diversity Council held its meeting in conjunction with an affinity group and was exposed to both the SAGE organization along with American Indian Native Alaskan culture and training. With great respect for this culture, cedar was used to purify the signing table Cedar is one of the four sacred plants used by many Native Americans. The four plants are cedar, sweetgrass, tobacco, and sage. Sirs, will you take a seat, please? We waited a long time for this. Let's give him a hand. Right on. Very good. Great. Yes. As is customary at a significant event as this, Chairman Garso is presenting the National Guard with a SAGE hand drum. The hand drum was constructed by a SAGE member in Mo Montana using local wood and hide. The SAGE symbol, which represents a medical will and the four sacred di uh, directions, has been painted on the drum along with three painted fe feathers which are attached. Four hundred and sixty thousand of us uh, strong. I uh, return a coin of thanks to you for all you do and the great work that you do. We'll treasure this gift uh, forever in our uh, bureau. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Now I would like to present to you Chief Warren Officer Three. Doris Sumner, would you please come forward to MC the Excellence and Diversity Awards program? Good morning. I am honored to uh, be the MC for the celebration that we're about to begin. I'm the State Diversity Manager and Equal Employment Manager for Vermont. So I know firsthand how challenging it is for states to initiate diversity uh, implementations in the state. But uh, it takes work and effort and great leadership, but it's worth it. Diversity brings value to the organization and extends well beyond those we are gonna recognize here today. Today we publicly identify our National Guard Bureau's organizational heroes unit and individuals who embody the organizational core values to serve not just as role models, but represent the National Guard as symbols of inspiration and innovation. In review of numerous and impressive nominations nationwide, 
the NGB Excellence in Diversity Awards Selection Board identified the following leading units and individuals determined as best in class diversity leaders based on rigorous diversity leadership standards and criteria. We now recognize the 2011 National Guard Bureau Excellence in Diversity winners. The first category to be recognized is the Joint State or Territory Award. This award is presented to the state or territory that has made significant contributions to joint diversity readiness with appropriate resourcefulness for the accomplishments of initiatives, implementing of diversity objectives, and the goals to impact the readiness of the unit and onboard trained diversity facilitators. So the 2011 Excellence in Diversity State Award goes to the Joint Force Headquarters, Massachusetts, for their statewide recognition as top performers. <laughs> Accepting the award for the Massachusetts National Guard is Lieutenant Colonel Karen Colleen, Director A-1. Mr. Tom Desmond, State Equal Employment Manager. First Lieutenant Randy Mendoza, Asian Pacific Islander Employment Manager. And CW5, Joe Quinn, Command Chief Warrant Officer, Massachusetts Army National Guard. This award is presented based on the results and accomplishments generated through senior leaders and a viable and active Joint Diversity Executive Committee. Through the years, the Massachusetts National Guard experienced increased partnerships, cooperation, connectivity among local, state, and National Guard communities. The next category to be recognized is the Army and Air Unit Awards. These awards recognize a unit or wing that has made significant contributions to diversity readiness with appropriate resources for the accomplishment of the job implementation of diversity activities that impact the readiness of the unit. The 2011 Army National Guard Unit Award goes to the Army National Guard Strength Maintenance Division National Guard Bureau. <laughs> Their accomplishments include a strategic plan that integrates diversity to attract and reach untapped markets, develop new state diversity award to recognize state with widest strides in diversity, and develop new website application to share census data reports with EO, EEO, recruiting and retention elements, and G1s. Accepting the award are Major General Tim Cadavy, Deputy Director, Army National Guard, and Lieutenant Colonel Mani Ulis, Deputy Division Chief, National Guard Bureau, Army National Guard Strength Maintenance Division. <laughs> the next is the Air National Guard Wing Award. The 2011 Wing Award goes to the 114th Fighter Wing South Dakota Air National Guard. <laughs> Accepting the award is Major General Tim Reich, the Adjutant General South Dakota National Guard, Brigadier General Wayne Shanks, Air Assistant to the Adjutant General, Colonel Russ Waltz, Wing Commander, 114th Fighter Wing. Colonel Matt Jamison, Chief of Staff. State Command Chief Master Sergeant Jim Welch. And Senior Master Sergeant Jen Reese, Wing Human Resource Advisor. The 114th Wing developed tribal relations with the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Council, maintains an active diversity and force development council, the Dakota Stampede Newsletter, and generated numerous diversity initiatives through state partnership program with Suriname South America. <laughs> Next, the Individual Army and Air National Guard Awards. This award category recognizes the professional accomplishments and achievements beyond the standard duties and requirements of the position, demonstrating innovation and unusually high impact initiatives, exceptional resourcefulness, and notable achievement. The 2011 Excellence in Diversity Individual Award for the Air National Guard goes to Major Jose Salcido from the 184th Intelligent Wing, Kansas Air National Guard.
Major Salcedo is receiving the award for his efforts in developing cultural awareness and support for diversity initiatives, resulting in positive and productive relations with public government and non-government organizations through leading the Walk Against Gang Violence, partnering with Kansas, which Kansas National Guard, Wichita Police, and local church communities. He is the 2011 Latina Style Meritorious Service Awardee and showcased nationwide in the fiscal year Air National Guard Operationalizing Diversity video. The 2011 Excellence in Diversity Individual for the Army National Guard goes to Staff Sergeant Timothy Dean, HHD 711th Brigade Support Battalion, Alabama National Guard. Staff Sergeant Dean is an outstanding soldier recognized by Alabama National Guard senior leaders and is recognized statewide for the noteworthy inspiration to others through mentoring of youth in his community, modeling and dedication to duty. Staff Sergeant Dean serves the community to broaden the knowledge of U.S. history of the Civil War. We was recently recognized with the Commandant's Award in Warrior Leader Course and recognized by Brigade General Gable for his outstanding service to his community. Our final award is the Air National Guard Human Resource Advisor of the Year. This award is to recognize an airman that has demonstrated outstanding performance and achievements that positively impacted the Air National Guard and demonstrating outstanding leadership and management competencies in diversity and inclusion. The 2011 Excellence in Diversity Human Resource Advisor is Chief Master Sergeant William Yokel from the 176th Wing Alaska National Guard. Chief Yokel developed Air National Guard-wide diversity demographic trend analysis, was recognized by Director Air National Guard Lieutenant General Wyatt for strategic initiatives, and was showcased in fiscal year 11 Air National Guard operationalizing diversity video. Accompanying Chief Yokel is Brigadier General Deborah McManus, Air Assistant to the Adjutant General, Alaska National Guard, and Colonel Scott Wenke, 176 Wing Commander. Uh, would Mr. Gerard Winters, Mr. Rich Rico, and Ms. Phyllis Brantley please come forward and join General McKinley on stage? Chief of the National Guard Bureau Civilian Excellence Award presented to Phyllis Brantley for her pursuit of greatness through diversity. Congratulations. There you go. Congratulations. And to Mr. Winters, also a Chief National Guard Bureau Civilian Excellence Award presented to Jared Winters for his pursuit of greatness through diversity. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I couldn't uh, be more proud to give you that. Thank you so much. And to Mr. Rich Rico, from the Chief and all of our leadership, Civilian Excellence Award for his pursuit of greatness through diversity. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it very much. I'm not kissing you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks very much. <clears throat> This concludes the uh, 2011 Diversity Awards uh, Ceremony, and I'm going to turn the stage back over to General McKinley. I want to give you this award for a great job narrating. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> well, that's exciting, and uh, I know yesterday uh, motivational speakers were up here, and, and I know they energized you, and I heard such great comments last night about um, all the things that have been given 
uh, to us. I'll probably need a new XO because my book's not up here, but I've never needed a book before, have I? No. Okay. Um, I'm your last speaker before we take a break, and uh, I know it's been a, a, a long morning. And, and uh, Bill, thanks again to you for hosting here in Reno. Uh, Jim Gorham, your name hadn't been mentioned yet, but as the co-chair of the JDEC and as our Army National Guard co-chair, uh, I want to thank you personally for all the work you've done and, and all the committee members uh, who have made uh, life for me easy because you have scoped uh, the issue, you have presented solutions, you haven't just presented challenges or problems, and I think we are well on our way, as General Wyatt and General Cadavy said, to implementing all the tools, uh, giving the field the tools necessary so that the adjutants general, who are the bosses in the states, territories, and the district, uh, can choose to shape and mold their diversity programs um, for your various and respective organizations. You stole my book, didn't you? You know, he started out by talking about oozing this morning. And we're gonna have a little ooze here if you can't get my notes found pretty quick. <laughs> don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Your, your efficiency report is on my desk, and, and you know, he, He's been brown nosing me for about the last six months. And, and now, here I am, I got nothing. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. See, Ondra said this morning, Ondra always kind of gives me a shape. So does the chaplain, Father Alphonse. You know, when you walk out on a stage like this with a group like this, uh, I really feel at home. I feel very comfortable. That's not always the case for us. Sometimes we walk out on stages and and you really can't feel the energy or feel the passion. But the reason y'all are here is for the same reason we were able to get out here today is because this subject is very, very important to us. So Ondra said this morning, we need to create more passion in our hearts for this program. We've got the science, we've got the way ahead in terms of numeric achievements, goals, uh, we've got metrics, we've got handbooks, and what I want to leave you with today in the very short time that I have is to follow up what Bud and, and Tim said is to say, this has got to be a program, a project, a mission, a journey that's embedded deeply inside our hearts. Because without that, uh, this becomes just more of the routine, more of the mundane. Um, how many folks think right now that where you left the organizations you work in really care that you're here? Do they really think that you're achieving a purpose? Do they expect when you come home to hear that you've had an opportunity for two and a half days to one, rub shoulders with people of similar thoughts, ideas, and beliefs? To reinforce the values in you that make you who you are? The values that make you such a key contributor to the organization in which you work? Uh, to the families in which you reside, and to the communities. Because I would say the National Guard has two inalienable rights that no other military organization in the United States of America has. Number one, we all possess individuality. We encourage it. We think that's what's important. We don't want to destroy it. But we also believe that out of many become one. So the individual, all of us, create the desire and the passion that molds and shapes us into one large, effective, powerful organization. 375 years is a long time to have survived the slings and arrows, literally and virtually, of this government and this nation and this world. And so, out of many, one voice. I'm looking at the many, the people who are individuals, but who were also rooted into our communities across our great land. And that's what makes the National Guard what it is today. No other organization, uniform or not, can say that. And so when you leave here and when you go home, I hope someone comes up to you and says, tell me what happened at the diversity conference. Tell me what you learned. Was it worth your time? 
Is the cause worth the effort? In Washington, there's a great saying now, is the juice worth the squeeze? I love that line, because we've all made lemonade, and you know how hard it is to squeeze that drop of juice out, but when it's done, and when you do it right, it's a great, refreshing summer drink. And if we do this right, if we provide the tools to our great leaders, represented over here uh, by our adjutants general and our assistant adjutants general who are here. If we do that at a bureau and if we can resource with Mr. Cabrera's help and with our Army National Guard and Air National Guard resources that are available, and those will come under challenge, I assure you, we will continue to provide the juice that is definitely worth the squeeze. So thank you to our great leaders. Thanks, Lou, for all you do. Uh, Mr. Cabrera is a Nevada Guardsman, former Nevada Guardsman, but once a member, always a member, right, Bill? You didn't revoke his membership, did you? And so to have you here in your home uh, where you grew up and where you gave so much in the Army National Guard, I want to recognize you personally today for all you do because without it, we wouldn't be here today. You know, the second row is important too. All the folks in that second row make us who we are. I, I want to single out our senior enlisted leadership and our chief warrant officer leadership, Gary, thanks. I neglected that last night. You know, as an Air Force airman, uh, we don't have the grade warrant officer. And Gary and I have had this run in battle since I became chief. What the heck is a warrant officer? I, I don't understand it. How do you do it? But it's a pretty good gig, I understand. There's about, <laughs> about 4,500, right, roughly? And they've got the deal, they got, we should have some of this, you know, bud, we may want to start this war. We did have it at one time, I think. But Gary, thanks for all you do. Chris, thanks for what you do. I know you may not have publicly announced it, but would I be, offend you if I did? Chris is going to uh, finish up a great military career and head back to the great state of Ohio. Uh, but I can't thank Chris Muncy enough for all he's done in his Air National Guard tenure. Uh, following uh, Chief Dick Smith, another Ohio Guardsman. Um, I think Ohio has a monopoly on uh, our senior enlisted leader for the Air National Guard, thanks. Uh, appreciate all you've done. And I've gotta thank Tim Cadavy for recognizing that Command Sergeant Major Birch, uh, a Nebraska Guardsman, uh, was the right person to bring uh, to town. And, uh, Sergeant Major, thanks for all you do, and thanks for your leadership. But the enlisted force couldn't be better served. And I know Chief Jelinski Hall is not here. She had to leave earlier, uh, but uh, Denise has done a great job for me. So that, that's the background. Those are the people who support me. Now, to the message, which if I had my book, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> um, again, from the heart, right? You said from the heart. Um, I'm going to single Jim out for a second here. I know you probably don't want to be singled out, but I got it. Th this is the business we're in, a and we've had motivating speakers and things. I didn't catch it all, but I know we had some good stuff yesterday. Uh, Jim, Jim is not shy, and Jim, Jim will get you in the corner, and he will give you what he believes is the truth. Uh, Jim continues to press me personally to say, "This is all well and good. This is great to come together in here, but what's the overall achievement? Where are we going to say?" We're making progress uh, in our diversity programs and our diversity uh, plans. Uh, Jim grabbed me last night, and, and I always enjoy this kind of chat, but I'm gonna take one specific case where you said to me, I guess about a year and a half ago, you know, when you're a general officer, you achieve the grade of Brigadier General. For, for most of our general officers, we try very hard to get them through a course called Capstone. Uh, affectionately called finishing school, charm school, things like that. It didn't take for me, so I, I would love to go back, but um, it's hard. We only get seven slots a year in the National Guard, which is, again, an inhibitor to us continuing to develop people at the level that our active components have. During this uh, last five years, though, and Tim can validate this, we've had several chances where we've had fallouts because active duty members could not get back from, from their commitments overseas. Jim, Jim challenged me and he said, I want to go to Capstone and I've applied and I've done everything that I can do to put my name in front of whatever process we in the National Guard Bureau do to pick 
on behalf of the adjutant general, uh, the best, the brightest, the up and coming leaders of the National Guard. He said, I, I think my record deserves scrutiny. Well, I, you know, we, we all at this end of the room need to be hitting the head occasionally with the hammer. I went back and said, well, what is the process? And I found out that it's pretty much you take a folder and you go through your achievements. And if you know somebody, that helps. But the board that put together a fair and objective board, uh, adjutants general sit on it. Some of our Title X officers sit on it. But for some reason, your name never got to the top of the seven. And so I said, okay, I just made a mental note and I said, let's watch the next go around. So the next go around came and Jim's name was down around number 14. That's pretty good though when you consider the number of people around the nation. But you tried several times to do this. And so I called in the person who actually puts names to the spaces and I said, what's the deal here? Do you know General Gorham? No, sir, I don't know him, I, I know of him. Uh, do you know what he's done for the National Guard? N no, sir. Uh, was the board fair and objective? Yes, sir, the board was fair and objective. And so these are the top seven people. They were all white male, every one of them. And I said, you know, this may be my last chance as a leader to walk the talk, to say the process, I'm not gonna criticize the process, it is what it is. We might need to make some refinements. But this is my chance to take number 14 and put up in the top seven. And just your willingness to have approached me, to alert me, was a mentoring moment for me that maybe in all of our lives, we have chances to uplift people and bring them out and give them the chance that they deserve. And in that rare instance where I felt I had the prerogatives as the chief and we had the flexibility to go an extra mile, we went to Capstone, didn't we? Well, I thank you. I thank you, Jim. I thank you. Because had you not said, what about me? And I know everybody in this room at times does not want to promote themselves. But without the promotion, this leadership team is not clairvoyant. And we need Jim Gorms in all of our areas of responsibility to make sure the adjutants general know we've got good quality people. Because how long will it take to grow another Jim Gorham? It's going to take 25, 30 years. How, how long will it take to grow another Chris Muncy? 30 plus years. Command Sergeant Major Birch. We don't have time to wait for the system to bring a results that we all in this room know and desire and in our hearts know we can produce. We don't have time. We can't wait. We got to do it now. And so I encourage everyone in this room, because everyone in this room is a leader, to take the opportunity to look at the process. Make sure it is fair. Make sure it brings up the best and the brightest. And when you have a chance, uplift a person who needs just a chance to show what he or she's made of. I ask you all to go home, talk to your bosses, make sure that's important. You know, I see Joe Balskis here, and I am a proud Florida Guardsman. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm looking forward to going back to my home in Florida. And I remember that it was, I think, in 1974 when we brought our first female into the Air National Guard, early 70s, and that was Sushanka, I think. But at the same time, we brought our first African-American female in the unit, Anna Mike, with her sister, Phyllis. That was 1974. I'd graduated from college. The first woman, the first African-American woman. But I'm so proud of what I see when I go back and visit the home unit because we have done what we've tried to say are follow the tools, look at the handbook, bring people in of diverse backgrounds, we will be a better unit for it. And I know that's why South Dakota won the award here today too. The results speak for themselves. And I, I wanna thank you all, all you award winners. And I'm gonna close with this, Chaplain, and you're gonna have to forgive me. 
The mortal sins are important, and all of us grow up with our parents or our ministers, our clergy, or our schools talking about the mortal sins. So I don't want to make light of this religious analogy. But I think we need to declare despair a mortal sin. You know why? Because it ain't going to get any easier for us in the National Guard. It's going to get harder. We're going through something in this country I'm not sure we fully appreciate. I'm not sure our leaders can fix the problems that I sense are in our system through no great fault of, of human mind. It was just, we're broke. This country's flat broke. And no matter who's in the White House, we're going to need to have an institution of government that can lead and govern us out of this crisis. I was in Europe last week. Europe is imploding. There are no answers. The Greek citizens don't want to take the austerity measures. They want to live a normal life. They want to enjoy life. They aren't going to have a chance to enjoy a normal life. That's going to spread to Italy and Spain and elsewhere. We're in serious waters. That will create tension and despair in our organizations. What General Wyatt and his Air Guard team had to face last year and what I believe General Ingram, General Academy are going to face with our Adjutant General is a continuing constraint on what we all grew up with, which was a National Guard that can perform its job, its mission, with resources, train people, and we could make do with what we had. Well, we're going to have to go back to that core value of making do with what we have, because I don't think anybody in the five-sided funny farm is going to take care of us. There's no way. They're going to take care of their active component. So despair will seep into our organizations, and it's only in this room where you declare that despair is a mortal sin. We can't allow it to filter in. We'll lose good people. They'll get out. We can't afford it. <laughs> so I ask you all to go back home after you've spent two magnificent days. Phyllis, thanks. Ondra, thanks for the great leadership. Chairman, thanks for your participation here today. To Mr. Winters, Mr. Rico, and all the team that make up our, our uh, uh, leadership team in Washington. Go back home and grab a commander by the scruff of the neck and take him in a room or take her in a room and say, here's what I just experienced. I experienced an organization that came together with about 400 people that is committed to making us the best National Guard we can be under the circumstances we have to exist in. And it may not be the absolute most brand new watch, brand new plane, brand new uh, joint tactical vehicle that we have on our flight line or our motor pools, but we will make do because our citizens will need us. We've gone through 11 convulsive years of war. American public is tired. I haven't heard one guardsman or woman say they're too tired. They'll keep doing this till they drop. That's what makes me so proud to sit with the Joint Chiefs of Staff who think, you guys are done. We've overused you. We've overworked the National Guard. Well, you never were built for this. I just say, bring it on. Yeah. Bring it on. We're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. We're not going to go away. It's just the way it is. It's in our hearts. So, thank you all. God bless. I love y'all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I'll be selling tapes and CDs <laughs> for $5.99. <laughs> oh, we, we gonna get some mileage out of this one. <laughs> oh, we gonna get some, woo! Somebody needs to take up an offering. <laughs> Chaplain? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 
So you better call the Reno Fire Department. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Wow, that was uh, that was that was that was amazing, and uh, so needed. Uh, I, I believe that uh, that was the ultimate dispenser of hope for as we approach the uh, the rest of this year. And uh, I, I think I said earlier, you, this is as good as it comes right here in terms of our leadership. And uh, as they said, they broke the mold. And, and we so appreciate that we have people fighting for us every single day. So if we think we don't have the ability to go back with more zeal, more focus, more dedication, more passion, more fire, then just go and play this and let them know that the best is yet to come. So, we got them that. So having said that, we're going to have a chance to uh, take a break, and we will be back into your uh, breakout sessions starting at, I believe it's going to be 10.30, 10.30. So that'll give us a chance. You know, if, if you get the chance, you just want to touch the hem of his garment. All right, let's take a break. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>